Ah, oh, blessings. Back in the 1980s, an Episcopal priest by the name of Terry Fuller was in an academic seating around Darien, Connecticut and was asked by the parish to come out of an academic professor um, professorship that he had and move into a parish. So he took a posting in Darien, Connecticut as the priest for this Episcopal parish. And Father Fuller got there and on his first Sunday, he preached this amazing sermon and it was titled, Love. Now, after the sermon, the congregation breathed a sigh of relief. All right, he's a good preacher. We got a good minister here who can do good worship. And as the congregation filed out, they shook Father Fuller's hand and said, oh, Father Fuller, what a wonderful message. Father Fuller, we really were inspired by your words today. Now, the next Sunday when they came back, Father Fuller preached the exact same sermon again. The people were a little taken aback, but he said, you know what? They all were like, that was a really good sermon. So we could hear it again. And once again, as they filed out, they said, Father Fuller, that was a great sermon. Father Fuller, thank you for such an inspiring message. Now the third week when they came back to church, Father Fuller preached the exact same sermon again. The deacons of this Episcopal parish were now getting a little irritated and wondering if this was going to be the way it was. So they gathered in a little room off to the side and sent in one of their elder deacons to talk to Father Fuller about what they perceived to be a problem. And as this deacon went up to Father Fuller, he said, Father Fuller, you have preached the exact same sermon three Sundays in a row. And before he could go any further, Father Fuller said, that's right. And when we get this one right, we'll move on to another. Now, I tell you that story. It has been in my heart since I entered religious education as a profession back in the 1980s. I know I'm dating myself. And yet it has been a part of that for a very specific reason. You see, Often life gives us learning and education that is brand new. But more often than that, education is one of those things where we learn the same lessons over and over and over. And we keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. So education is the new, but it's also those things that we keep kind of integrating into our lives. And we find deeper layers of. Now, I am the daughter of a United Methodist minister. So I began my early days as a PK, a preacher's kid, or as we are known now as theological offspring. And in that situation was raised in the United Methodist Christian tradition. Now, once I got to high school, I thought for sure I was going to enter the ministry. And then in college, I did something that changed that completely. I read what is called the Book of Discipline, which is the rule book for the United Methodists. And one of the things that I discovered in that is that my dear brothers and sisters and siblings of LGBTQIA2 spirits could not be ordained ministers within this tradition. These were friends and colleagues. These were people I knew. And these were people I knew would be good ministers and carriers of a faith. So I decided that I could not become a minister in a tradition that upheld such a belief. So I switched and I went into religious education. And after serving a congregation um, in Newark, Delaware as their youth and young adult, pastor, I was, I was hooked. I was like, religious education is my calling. Now, go forward some years, and in the 1990s, I left the United Methodist tradition to become a Unitarian Universalist because it really better aligns with my faith, with my ideas of who the world is and how we should be involved in it. 
And so in 1999, I became a member of a congregation in Annapolis, in, in Annapolis, Maryland. And then four years later, I became a religious educator with a Unitarian Universalist church in Frederick, Maryland, which was a really exciting thing. Now, in 2006, I left that post and eloped with my husband. And on my way back from being married, I got a call from Reverend Carol Taylor, who at that point was a faith formation director with the Unitarian Universalist Association. She was serving what was then a district, the Joseph Priestley District. Now those are all regions. So the UUA has kind of reformatted things. But basically, Carol said, Michelle, do I have a deal for you? And what it was, was there was this new fangled thing called interim religious education. I'll talk a little bit about it in, in a minute. But what she wanted me to do was to be trained as an interim and then come back and work with some congregations in interim religious education, which means to help them in transitional work help them to face changes that they were dealing with, to face conflicts. And so that's what I did. And once again, my calling went deeper because I discovered that not just doing religious education fed me in deep places, but doing transitional work with religious education fed me in deep places. So I have been doing transitional religious education work since 2006, and I haven't looked back. It is a wonderful place to be. I have served congregations in Virginia, New Jersey, Maryland. Now I'm in Illinois and I'm absolutely, absolutely thrilled to now be working with the First Unitarian Church of Honolulu, Hawaii. So thank you. Now transitional or interim religious education is a valued part of the Unitarian Universalist movement. Why? Because lifelong learning is valued here. Historically, Unitarians have a deep understanding and a commitment to lifelong religious education. Now, Unitarian polity is congregational centered polity, and it has deep roots in the 16th century New England Christian congregationalists. The congregations of this time adopted a two minister role. So during that historic period of the 16th century, or excuse me, actually the 1600s, so it was the 17th century. During that time, the congregations called two ministers. They called a proclamation minister and they called an education minister. It was a collaborative ministry model and each of those ministers knew their roles and worked together to bring forth a holistic ministry to their congregations. Virgil Phelps is a historian who worked in the early 20th century. And one of the things that Virgil did was go into these congregations and pour through their records. And he took notes to see exactly what was the job description of these two different ministers. And what Dr. Phelps discovered was that each of them had distinct roles. The minister of education would interpret the scriptures while the minister of proclamation made the message known. The minister of education taught the Bible while the minister of proclamation performed visitation and pastoral care. The minister of proclamation attended to the administration of the congregation so that the minister of education would have time for study and research. And both pastors performed the sacraments of those Christian churches. Now, there is no doubt that the theology of those congregations is not the theology that we follow today as a part of Unitarian Universalist and Unitarian Universalist movements. However, that love of education, that commitment to lifelong learning is still in our DNA. Heck, it's going on right now. Every worship service 
has a message. And in that message, there is this mix of education and proclamation. 400 years later, and we are still showing that both are vital. Now, let's go um, forward about a couple of hundred years into the 1990s. Here's another bit of history that can kind of intersect as we tell some stories. In the late 1990s, there was a group of religious educators who noticed that they, there were many congregations who were having difficulty with transitions of religious education staff. They were finding that they were having a hard time getting going again after a religious educator left the congregation. They also noticed that other congregations were having trouble trying to figure out what's their religious education identity or where were they going? What's their future? You see, co congregations are complicated and interconnected communities. And it was sometimes thought that this lack of religious education identity was a religious education problem. But it is not. It wasn't then and it's not now. Discerning a congregation's religious education identity and its future is the work of the entire community. This early group of religious educators noticed that lifespan religious education transitions needed more attention than they received. So they developed a new program called Interim Religious Education. And that is a part of the program that trained me, the one that Reverend Carol Taylor called me into, so that we could become specialists in understanding change and transition. This isn't just about the transition between religious education professionals. Transition work is about looking at lifelong learning and to help congregations see who we are. What is our identity? Who are we as a learning people? What role does learning play in our community? And then once you understand your identity to start dreaming and looking forward, how do we vision our religious education future? Now, no innovation will come in a vacuum. At the time that this vibrant art form of interim religious education was being practiced and fine tuned, we were hopping into the 21st century. And as the 21st century opened wide its doors, we discovered that the models of 1950s religious education were not working for most families. And so now there's creative energy around how do we learn? When do we learn? Who's with us when we learn? And what role does that learning play within our congregations? Once again, one of the great gifts that we are discovering is that religious education is not something that happens in one corner of the congregation. Religious education happens all the time. Education happens in worship. It happens at your board meetings. It happens when you gather for a cup of coffee or tea. It happens when you're walking out to the parking lot. We are a learning people that constantly are being inspired and not just learning new ideas, but reframing ideas that we already have. So here we are. You are a congregation in discernment. And that's not hard to do because every congregation is always in discernment. That's not a new thing. But here are the questions in front of you as I virtually step into the space with you. What does religious education mean in this community? How does the religious education of our children and youth intersect with the full congregation? And how does lifelong learning play a vital role in your future? It's also important to know that we are living in the midst of a global pandemic. 
And noting that as we do discernment is something that needs to be held both honestly and genderly. Now, if you remember from today's reading, Dr. Bo Young Lee provides us with an interesting and challenging view of what it means to be a community. The continental United States dominant model of community is European centered and it's based on the value of the individual. Dr. Lee points out that this is not necessarily the practice of most of the world. Now you all may have a better understanding of this than most. I look forward to learning more about your congregation, your families, and your deep roots in Hawaiian culture and values. I come into this and I wonder, what is it that you will teach me? I am ready to listen and to learn. And what aspects of Dr. Lee's intersection between community values and community learning do you all already incorporate into your Unitarian community? Individual ideas and thoughts are highly valued. And then ultimately community ideas and thoughts will bring higher truths. It is my hope that as we work together, you will have many opportunities to hear and develop community ideas around lifelong learning. The cool thing about community models is that there's not just one, they are multifaceted. Hopefully holding the diversity and the breadth of passion and need from your community. I look forward to exploring these with you. Father Fuller's wisdom comes back to us during this interim time. Some of the lessons that we will learn over the next few months will be brand new and others of them will be taking ideas and things that we know and shifting and reframing them. I look forward to those aha moments, the ones that I have in me and the ones that you have in you. Education and learning are amazing attributes of our existence, and they happen in so many creative and amazing forms. Now we can explore them in new ways that we will make this community stronger. That is my hope for you. Thank you for your courage to enter into this work. And thank you for inviting me to travel with you. Blessed be.